talk a little bit about influence in the arts. How do you subsume influence? Uh, you've talked about the poet Spice Rack, but it can be a multimedia thing, correct? And uh, someone who, I, I think that lesser retreads, John Ashbery, for example, in his best work uh, early on, he was more along the lines of a retread of Wallace Stevens. So you often think, well, what's the point? Um, even if, if the work itself is great. Originality isn't important, as you've said, compared to greatness. But talk a little bit about subsuming influence in the arts and how to jump around through your influences. Uh, mostly, mostly when people talk about influence, they, they talk about it very superficially. You know, uh, you hear, for example, someone talking about David Fincher being influenced by Brian De Palma, say as a filmmaker, or by Scorsese. And th this comes from, oh, he, he cuts his scenes very quickly here or there. But there's nothing really that similar about them, their films, the, the interests, the outlooks. So I think people misinterpret that. Um, you know, I, uh, I don't know how someone necessarily would be influenced by my stuff. I think they would probably want to... They would probably look and say, okay... Dan redid this genre thing, or Dan redid sonnets and did it by, by going leftward, rightward, upward, fourth dimension would. Um, and so there they is would, a cosmic strain throughout your work. The way you were describing a kid's book before, there's always the outer world as well as the inner world of the book. It's always pushing outward. It's, it's, it's looking to the cosmos all the time. Yeah, I don't... I, I'm... I think I, I have a couple of shows in the next week or two that I'm going to do talking about the quote-unquote multiverse with different people with different ideas about it. And uh, I'm, not a, I'm not really a believer in the multiverse. I, I, I don't think that every time you go left or right that you split into two. You know, Schrodinger's cat was ultimately a joke. No one, no one uh, Schrodinger himself used that as an example that, you know, uh, the double slit experiment where light can be either a wave or a particle function, uh, it's absurd to say that it can be both. Even he recognized in his notes that, that our current science probably fails. But people who don't realize that he was making a joke with Schrodinger's cat think that, that, they're, that what he was really saying was, oh, light became a, a wave and a particle when it does the double slit experiment. And I, I won't go into it. You can just Google it. Um, but in reality, what he was saying is how absurd it was. And so I, I, don't, I don't believe, for example, that, that there are multiple universes. But in the writing, it's a good artistic tool to use, to breaking the fourth wall. What is real? What is not real? You don't want to overdo it. Um, I, don't, I don't really have uh, the spy breaking the fourth wall in this book. He's a different narrator than Manny Cole. Manny Cole is, infiltrates all four books of the New York Quartet, but he's not going to appear anywhere else other than maybe being referenced as some hack writer who wrote about gangsters or something that maybe, you know, maybe I, I might have uh, in a book in ten, five or ten years a character opening up a book and talking about and maybe he'll read a passage that's from a Norwegian in the family that I don't mention the name of the title, but I'll have it. You know, there'll be those little winks and nods that fans like to read about. Uh, but, but uh, you know, so I, like I said, uh, my influence, how, how you might be influenced by my poems, I don't know. I can't say how Alex Sherman might be influenced, how some kid who's not going to discover Cosmoetica for another five or ten years how some woman or some young girl or some guy might read Jessica's books about Japan and, and, and maybe be influenced. I, I, I don't know. Uh, generally, though, it's superficial. Uh, when I've been influenced, like by Whitman or whatnot, I did write a lot of Whitmanian long line thing, but that's not really influence. That's just copying that whatnot. Uh, the fact that Whitman was bold to open up poetry like that, that's the biggest influence. And my influence is that I open up everything. Uh, where Whitman just had that one opening up and he had his whole poetic world within, I open up in every book. Like I said, my Gorgeous George book is going to be vastly different from my spy book that I open up with. My spy book is vastly different from the four books of the New York Quartet, which are vastly different in many ways from themselves, even as they have a co inner coherence within that quartet. 
Um, so maybe maybe people will look and by opening something up, by opening up and saying, no, I'm going to write a sci-fi book like the Foundation Trilogy. It's going to be more based on the real science that we've accumulated in the last 90 years or 120 years, however far in the future someone does this. But I'm going to open up Asimov and turn him inside out. And I'm going to do that because I'm going to take a Dan Schneider approach. So you may not, you may get that sci-fi book that's a 2065 version of uh of the foundation 125 years after the original foundation trilogy came into being but you're not going to detect dan schneider's uh influence by the fact that he's going to use immersive techniques he's going to use uh my discursive techniques the influence may simply be that he's flipped around and opened up and poured through asimov and turned asimov to his own thing that's what dan schneider would have done even though the the technical stuff that dan schneider did it has no bearing. So that may be how that influence works. So it can work in yeah. many different ways. Wider scope and diversity yeah. in the main. Quality, quantity, and diversity. Those are the three keys to, to great art. Uh, one final question. Uh, I've wanted to ask you this before, but Cosmoetica holds most of, well, not most of, not even close, uh, but it holds a, a portion of your work. Um, Bearing the fact that there's no publication for your work later on, and I'm optimistic, and I hope you have maintained your optimism, um, you would likely put everything on Cosmetica, right? Uh, no, I mean, because I mean, unless, unless, let's say, if if you know, I'm a widower and I'm 80 years old, and and I I'm not going to be able to make any money. Um, I would probably get someone like Alex Sheremet if he's still alive or you, if you're still alive or some other young kid that comes along. And I probably, you know, will you to ask you to be a literary executor to see if they could get published. But once I'm dead, it would be like what I'm trying to do for James Emanuel that, you know, get it out there. I, uh, you know, the James Emanuel thing is very frustrating because apparently he left no will. So there are no executors of his will. And so that means that these idiots who have his poems that are published by Lotus Press or, or other presses, it's a mishmash. And how the hell, to do it, I'm not. I'm not there. I. Uh, I uh, yeah, you've done some good insurance. There's several curators of your poems, and uh, most of your books. Yeah. Uh, and the one question relates that once uh, once you are dead and gone, would you have Cosmoetica live on after it? Or would I, you I would. What I would. Cease? What I would like to do is, you know, I guess I would do is I would. If I'm old, I would go to a university. One of the things I'm, I'm going to have to do is will and have a will to say, let's say if I'm living in Texas, well, who knows if I retire and move out to New Mexico and, and will my works uh, to be archived there, send copies to the Library, the Co library of Congress, um, uh, release them into uh, either public domain so that uh, things like the Dover books or the Wordsworth editions in Britain would be free to publish them. If I can't make any money on it, I want it out there. I mean, I want I want my work and Jessica's work out there. I mean, I do think that something can happen in five or ten years. Again, I was what I had stated earlier. You know, this vexes Jessica to such a degree, uh, and it, it thereby vexes me. Uh, it vexes me a little bit on my own, but mostly via Jessica and. And the psychological damage it does to her. I mean, people talk, you know, you talk about the psychological damage of a Ted Hughes to a, uh, to a Sylvia Plath. But what about the psychological damage of all these bad editors, these bad publishers that only publish their fucking friends, only look to see if there's an MFA because they only publish these fucking MFA hacks because they have an MFA. And you rub my back, I'll rub your back instead of looking at the work. And most of these people have been, they're two or three generations removed from when great writing was being taught. You know, I, I have nothing against multiculturalism uh, as an idea that you should praise great people who come up with great inventions or who are great leaders who are black or Chicano or gay or, or women or Jews or Muslims or whatnot, but their work has to do that. You can't use tokens. This is one of the major problems with liberal political philosophy, too, is the liberals 
liberals use tokenism to an even more frustrating and vexing uh, degree than are used by were used by conservatives. You you know, to me, an Aunt Jemima can be offensive. But these people didn't know any better. When Aunt Jemima came along, people didn't know any better. But people like that, uh, what, Humble the Poet, people like Amaya Angelou, they, they, per, they procreate even more stereotypes. And these are the things, when you're taught that Maya Angelou is some kind of a, a, a writer of substance, even if you're ignoring her, her, her sub-Hallmark card verse, and just dealing with uh, uh, her six or seven memoirs, starting with I Know Why a Cage Bird Sings, or I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, even if, you, to do that, it does such damage, because you have people then growing up that, I remember Jessica saying to me, and I think Alex and a few other young people saying, saying that they would be taught, taught this stuff in college, which it gives it an imprimatur, and saying, but this is bad. Why are you telling me this is good? Why are you holding this up as good? I can tell this is bad. And this makes people then say, say, is there something wrong with me? This is why Jessica will, will question her own great writing because some idiot editor who wants to publish Hick by this 12-year-old girl, I forget her real name, Andrea, Andrea Portes, that just came to me. I think that's her name. If you're, you know, this, this agent would say, oh, one agent said, oh, your book is great, Jessica. Uh, but I, she wanted to portray, publish Andrea Portez's Hick, because that's also a great book. No, it isn't. I read that book. I, I read through like 80% of that book literally in about less than a half an hour when I was sitting one time at a Barnes & Noble and Jess was off looking through her own, whatever else you had caught her attention. And I'm like, how the hell can you say that? You, if you tell me, oh, Dan Schneider is a great poet, just like James Tate, that tells me you don't have any fucking clue. You know, Dan Schneider is a great poet like Donald Hall. You're an idiot. Dan Schneider. Oh, yeah, I, I love Dan Schneider. And uh, he, he's almost as good as David Foster Wallace, maybe even a little bit better. How can you even talk in the same breath uh, of that? It makes no sense whatsoever but it damages the mind of young artists. This is why I do these interview shows and I try to, to, to put out these ideas in these more palatable sort of like vitamin forms. Rather than having you, people eat a grand feast of art, maybe just give these little pep pills uh, that, that'll turn people onto something. And that's, that's the way I view these, uh, these interviews that I do. And sometimes the people themselves don't know what they're talking about. Uh, in any depth, but I do. And so by getting them on, they may say 90% bullshit, but that 10% where they evoke something from me may be the thing that it makes that worthwhile. I did this interview with this actress woman. She's talking about, she was talking, I asked her, you know, is it easy to do a love scene with, say, Robert Redford or Wallace Shawn? Do you, because Redford's so much better looking, is it easy to do? She said, no, you have to, she says, you have to find something that you find exciting as the character. You know, if Wallace Shawn, you know, even as a young man uh, during my dinner with Andre was bald and kind of weird looking and, you know, he had little nervous tics and he had a, a upturned pig nose and these lips. He's not, he wasn't an attractive human being. But she said, you know, you might find his baldness attractive. You might find his, his uh, uh, eyebrows stimulating. That's what you have to focus on. It was very wise words from her. Karen Austin, a, a very, an actress who I think should have gotten a lot more than she ever did in her career. Um, but, uh, and so that's why I do these actor interviews. You have to find these things. But when you, when you uh, promote bad stuff, and just to give you the flip side of that, she was talking about how she thinks that television is a go in a golden age. And I disagreed with her very Bluntly, I said, but I didn't go into it. I said, we're not going to argue about that. This, that wasn't the point of the interview. But when you make these grand conflations and they are so obviously wrong, you do harm to the artist. When you don't publish the works of Dan Schneider, uh, whether it's just my poetry, whether it's my books, when 
when my great interviews with whomever it might be, when I do a great interview and uh, about Antonioni or something, and it's only got 800 hits in six months online, and yet you can have uh, this crap, mostly crap by this Alain de Baton, get a quarter of a million hits in its first day online. Or even worse, you get you get these bad wannabe art sites that, uh, or philosophy sites or these things that, you know, uh, that'll show two idiots walking into a barn, hear some sound and say, it must be aliens up in the up in the the hayloft. And, and then you see some bad and, you know, 25.2 million hits in three months or something. I mean, there there is a price that you pay for that. And it's I, I'm not apocalyptic or whatnot. But how many how many young writers like yourself could benefit if they read my stuff? Because you happened, I guess, you stumbled upon Cosmoetica, however you stumbled upon it. But if I have a wider net and I have, even if I only sold 20 or 30 or 50,000 books at the most uh, for each of my books, or just sold the same for her books, that would cast a wider net. It would help those people out there because these people are being denied the wisdom that the translation of reality that my art or Jessica's art, great art, can do in favor of Hick, in favor of this. And it's the diluted, schools, but it all, but schools, hold on, hold on, hold on, shit. hold on, hold on. But it also has a damaging effect. If you want to know why the cliche of artists uh, being damaged individuals occurs, is that most of them aren't real artists. Most of them are people who are damaged to begin with. But when you have great artists like uh, a Kafka, who knows what Kafka could have done? Maybe he would have moved beyond just his three rote kind of stories, the, the three great pieces, the one the one tale of the isolated loner. Had he gotten recognition for those stories, had he gotten praise, had he gotten published, had he been able to 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 uh, live a, a better life than just a menial clerk, maybe he would have moved beyond. Maybe he would have been as great as those people say that he is when he really isn't. He did have some great stuff, but he's not He's not this genius. Maybe William Shakespeare, uh, well, he, he had... The, the the low people recognition or whatnot, but maybe if in that era he had uh, had gotten more uh, recognition, he would have not had the terrible histories and the terrible comedies that he wrote, and he would have been the Shakespeare uh, commensurate to the the praise that he's gotten. Maybe Sylvia Plath, had she uh, been lauded more during her lifetime, would not have settled on a Ted Hughes and on the course that made her kill herself. Maybe. All of these uh, poets, the romantic poets or the John Berrymans or whatnot, had they got a little bit more, they would have not only not killed themselves, but they would have grown as artists. I've gone through bad times and, and whatnot, but I, I still hew to, to the art. Uh, but it is frustrating. Uh, I, you know, everyone questions themselves. Did I make the right choice or whatnot? And they shouldn't have to do that if you're a great artist because the great art should be recognized because great artists are greater than great scientists. They are not as replaceable as the greatest scientists. No Stephen Hawking, no Albert Einstein is as important, is as irreplaceable as a Dan Schneider or a Herman Melville or a John Cassavetes, even though he only has three inarguably great films. A Cassavetes is more important to the human uh, experience than Einstein because Quite frankly, Einstein had maybe three, four, five great ideas. Uh, at the core of these of these big theories that he had, there's only three or four great ideas in, in all that he thought of. And I would say those three or four great ideas, while they have application in the real world, some some do, some don't, there is, you're not going to find out as much about the cosmos because as, as you mentioned, Emily Dickinson, we contain the cosmos in our mind. So the ability to get into our mind, to use art, art helps us understand the cosmos, translates reality, and that's something more than, than science can do, which can only basically tabulate reality. If you want to use a term, science doesn't define reality or, or comment on it. It tabulates. It says you've got this much of that, that much of that. This is how this works. The gears move. Uh, not in a clockwork sense, but in a quantum physical sense. But art gets into the deeper stuff.